Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, a special welcome to Mr. Simon Davis, who is also our keynote speaker for today. And uh, I'd like to just uh, take a, a few words to uh, take a few minutes to talk about uh, the importance of uh, these kind of gatherings. Uh, at SMU, uh, across the university, we're sort of uh, taking uh, an approach uh, where we try to integrate uh, research education and practice. Uh, almost every university around the world will tell you that we do research and then based on the research, uh, you know, we have the theory-driven practice. But at SMU, we feel it is uh, really, really important to engage, uh, you know, with the uh, community, whether it's a, it's a government agency or it is the financial sector uh, in, in the Shenton way. And uh, because we feel uh, that a lot of learning is actually happening outside the classroom. Uh, we don't, uh, unlike an engineering school, we don't have laboratories. Our labs, if you will, is the real world. And uh, therefore, it is really, really important to you know, bring in the external perspective. And on that uh, measure, um, Simon, I'd really like to thank you and uh, Fred uh, you know, for sponsoring the, you know, this event. Uh, just a couple of uh, comments uh, about uh, Simon and about uh, Thread Needle, and then I want to make a comment or two about the topic itself. Um, Simon has a master's from Oxford, and I don't know how he managed to combine engineering, economics, and management in, in one degree. It's really, really creative. Or oh, there's two degrees. It's one degree. It's one degree, okay. So it's really creative. My teachers so, would say I didn't combine them. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so you know, he, he brings in, uh, you know, these uh, uh, multidisciplinary perspective, which is what actually SKBI is all about. Uh, SKBI has uh, four research centers in it. Uh, CASA is the one that's sponsoring this event. We also have a center that's focusing on corporate governance and investor relations, uh, CCIR. Uh, we have a center uh, that is uh, looking at, uh, you know, financial economics. And uh, then we have a center that is doing research in social security, meaning retirement and aging and things like that, and uh, adopting a multidisciplinary perspective. So if you take uh, you know, CASA as an example, uh, we have faculty from economics working in it. We have faculty uh, in the area of uh, real estate. Uh, we have faculty, of course, uh, looking at uh, issues such as private equity and, of course, the securities market. And uh, so we are uh, very interdisciplinary, and what you've done, Simon, pretty much reflects that. Uh, about uh, uh, Threadneedle, uh, Threadneedle is, has been an active uh, supporter of education, and uh, they have uh, a strong partnership uh, with, uh, uh, with CAS in London. And SMU has uh, just announced a master's program in quantitative finance in collaboration with uh, CAS. So it'll be a joint degree uh, bearing uh, our logo as well as uh, the CASA's logo from London. So uh, you know we are uh, looking at collaboration. I understand uh, that we have uh, some students from N uh, NTU. Show of hands, please. Um, <coughs> welcome to welcome to SMU, and we've been working uh, with your president uh, Bertel. Uh, to see if we can explore uh, ways in working together on issues related to entrepreneurship and innovation. So hopefully before too long there will be some joint projects uh, between NTU and uh, NSMU as well. Um, well moving to today's uh, topic, uh, this topic is kind of near and dear to me. It's talking about education versus experience. As a doctoral student, um, I really didn't know what I was doing. I hate to admit it to in any gathering. I was trying to make up my mind. And I was coming from engineering, and I was trying to make up my mind, should I do finance or should I do uh, strategy? And uh, with finance, it was pretty cut and dry in those days. It was mid-70s. And at that time, the issue was, you know, how do you manage risk? And you diversified the risk. And I was far more interested in understanding what were the underlying parameters, what was causing the risk. So I went into the strategy side, which dealt more with the second aspect. Uh, a few years later, after I got my PhD, I started working uh, quite a bit with the corporate community. And, and the guy who shared my office with me in the doctor program, he finished his PhD in finance. And he asked me, so, so Raj, how do you get all these consulting assignments? 
I said, it's pretty easy. The paradigm in finance in those days was, uh, you know, the capital asset pricing model. And what that basically said, that there's no way you can make extra returns without taking on extra risk. And in effect, it basically said, we as I mean, academics can't help you. <laughs> so this guy's name was Tom McKenzie. I said, Tom, if you're going to tell somebody that there's no way you can help them, no matter how much you pay them, why the hell do they pay you? <laughs> so I guess what we are really talking about, this theory, this education, and there's on the experiential side, this is where you're picking up information uh, that is going to be relevant in investments. And uh, I think, uh, again, uh, this, uh, this interdisciplinary part, but also reinforcing that the experience is going to come from, you know, on the job understanding, understanding the environment within which the investments are being made. So it's not just all theory, but it's also practice. So with that, uh, please welcome Simon Davis. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much for inviting me along. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I should say that I didn't actually choose the topic, and when I saw it, I thought, well, what on earth would I, uh, would I say about this? So I've had to put some, some thought into this, but uh, the more I thought about it, the more interesting it was. Um, a little bit about my credentials to talk about this. Um, uh, uh, it's been explained about my educational background. In terms of my practical background, I've been doing investments for 30 years, um, and I've been with Threadneedle for 16 years, originally as Chief Investment Officer, then as Chief Executive, and now, now as Chairman. Uh, during that time, our assets under management in Sterling have gone up from 22 uh, billion to 75 billion. And over the last um, uh, five years, about 85% of our funds are in the upper quartile of the survey, which is three, three times what you'd expect. I say that not out of arrogance, but to try and show that I'm, I'm surrounded by lots of people who do seem to have talent, so I get to observe them and decide whether they're, uh, they're any good at what they do um, or, or, or not. Um, as I said, I, I'm actually, uh, uh, well, the engineers would question whether I actually did engineering. The economists would be a little more flattered. I'm really a trained economist. Um, and as you know, an economist can't settle on one view. They have on the one hand, on the other hand. It's lucky that human beings only have two hands, otherwise they'd have even more views. Um, and I'm tempted to say when looking at this that I've had two views on this, and, and it's changed over time. When I appeared out of Oxford with no experience but a nice shiny economics degree, it was obviously the education that mattered. Now I've been overtaken by all these clever people with CFAs and MBAs, but I've got 30 years' experience. It's obviously the experience that matters. But I think I actually owe you a, a more accurate uh, explanation of my views than that, which I'll go over in the next 30 minutes. Uh, the next thing to say before I get into my talk is that uh, this is a, uh, a PowerPoint-free presentation, because I'm going to talk about the qualitative aspects of what I see makes a good investor, rather than quantitative analysis of, of this. And in some ways, I make no apologies for this, because actually doing a quantitative presentation would be quite difficult because finding sustainable alpha is about as easy as finding the Higgs boson. You show me somebody who's outperformed over the last five years, and the statistical link to them outperforming over the next five years is actually quite weak. Um, there is actually a, a stronger statistical link, the studies have shown, between bad funds remaining bad funds. So uh, you know, there's a consistency in idiocy. Um, <laughs> but a consistency in excellence is, is, is weaker. So I'm going to talk about more about the characteristics I've seen that would cause me to choose somebody to manage money, rather than about some statistical link between what somebody got on their SAT score and where their fund was 30 years later. <laughs> I thought that before asking what skills you need to do a job, it's best to understand what the job is you're trying to do. What are you actually trying to establish and match the skills to it? Um, and we came up with, you know, this, in the question, there's two E's, education and experience. And I think if you're picking stocks or markets or investments, there's actually two things you're, uh, you're, you're trying to uh, win on. And they're the two eyes. And one is information, and the other is insight. In terms of information, you're trying to know more about markets, essentially what's already happened, better information than your competitors. In terms of the other eye, the insight, you're trying to predict the future better. You're saying, from here, what will happen next? And I'm going to examine each of those uh, in order. So let's start with the, the first I, which is, um, is, 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 is information. 
The first thing to say that anybody who builds uh, uh, asset management outperformance on superior information uh, has uh, got increasing problem because companies and governments realize that you can't have unfair information advantage and they're now very careful about what data is released to who, to who and to when. So actually getting information before the market is, is difficult. And of course the regulatory authorities are really clamping down on this uh, very hard and they're pushing the definition of what is legal and illegal information advantage uh, uh, to a much higher burden of proof that it was, was legal. And lots of people have recently gone off to spend time at the uh, US government's uh, 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 leisure wearing orange jumpsuits to getting this wrong. Um, this, of course, is not actually a, a, a new thing. Um, illegal information advantage is, has been with us for, for a long time. I can remember when I was about your age, just starting out in the, uh, in the, in the investment uh, uh, world, um, I used to go along at lunchtime to try and improve my education to something called the Society of Investment Analysts. We got about 10, pe 10 sad people there at lunchtime together until we invited a man along called Ivan Boski, who was one of the great outperformers of the, uh, of the, uh, of the 1980s. And uh, we, we realized that we needed a bigger room. We even had the Chartered Accountants Hall. There were people queuing outside. It was 100 times more people than we'd ever had. And he told us how clever he was. Um, of course, he was then arrested about uh, six months later. And it turned out the entire of his alpha was illegal information on that. But there is some legal information you can get. So, so where do we sit on this whole um, education uh, versus experience? Um, the first way, of course, is that some stocks are very, very well followed. The larger cap stocks are. But there is still a constituency of stocks which are under-researched. So I guess if you get out there and work hard, you can establish an advantage. Um, and I guess that would lend itself to somebody of an educated background who is used to doing sort of academic research. So there's an area there where I, where I would expect to score. But of course the problem is when you get to the, to the larger stocks, actually finding information the market doesn't have I is tricky. But of course in terms of uh, uh, my definition of information being having be better understanding of the past, you can take that data and you can manipulate it so you get a better understanding of how a company truly works. Because when you meet with the management, they will tell you one thing about what's going into the company. The statistics often tell you something different. Now, a classic example of this would be um, high-growth companies with low returns on equity. The management will tell you the dream about how quickly the market's going to grow. Uh, but, of course, if your market is growing at 25% and you've only got a 12% return on capital, you have a problem. You cannot fund that. And you cannot get a 25% return on the stock. Now, of course, the management never actually tell you that the return on capital is only 12% because they fiddle their accounts to make it look as the return on capital is a lot higher. But, of course, if you've got a good academic training, you're capable of spotting the accounting items that should be removed to get you down to the core sustainable return on capital. And trust me, that is the return you'll get on the stock, not the growth of the market. And, of course, that, I think, does lend itself to people with a good formal education. I would have um, uh, two um, uh, uh, caveats on this, however, in terms of problems with this. <coughs> what I do observe in people who've got a good finance background is, is two problems. One is often obsession with the detail. They build incredibly detailed spreadsheet models that miss the main point, uh, and that is a weakness. The second is I think often people who come to markets from an academic background cannot believe that anything can be dramatically mispriced. So they almost reverse engineer the model to prove that the thing is either 10% expensive or 10% cheap. Now history tells you that stock prices are out by far more than that. So what you actually have to have is the courage of your convictions. Markets are wrong. If they're not, there's no point in having the, the education. <coughs> I will now, in terms of that kind of quant analysis though, I will now have my one point of sheer personal bias and bigotry in assessing, uh, uh, and hopefully the only one in the talk, <coughs> which is my, uh, my, uh, my scepticism about pure quant models. A lot of people come out of academia and build models that are pure data sifting quant models. I've seen every single one of those models look impressive, raise assets and then blow up. So that is something I'm very, very skeptical about. That is not to say I'm skeptical about the good use of academic finance in analyzing, uh, analyzing stocks. So I think education is a valuable uh, uh, tool in the first eye. So let's move on to the, the second eye, um, uh, uh, the future. Um, it was famously said by John Templeton that the foremost uh, expensive words on investment are, it's different this time. 
because actually understanding history and what has gone wrong in the past saves you an awful lot of money. And just, Sir John Templeton was a brilliant man. Um, and there is no doubt that having experience of previous economic cycles is very, very important in taking the, uh, the, the, the right decisions. Um, uh, you know, for, for, for two or three hundred years, you've had these seven-year economic cycles. Having a feel of how things play out is very, very, uh, very, very useful. Um, it's not a matter of necessarily of insight or superior intelligence. It's just knowing what usually happens. Um, an anecdote I like to tell to illustrate this is, 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 a, is a, a close friend of, of my wife's called Lisa. Um, and Lisa's first marriage didn't last very long. In fact, they broke up on their honeymoon. Um, so that wasn't very good. Um, but then Lisa got married a few years later. And we all went along. And it was the same church at the same time on Saturday with the same priest, the same wedding dress, and the reception was at the same club. So we all went along there. And um, you know, people were saying, well, where are the drinks? They're usually down here. Where is the dancing? Oh, it's usually about 7 o'clock. Um, it wasn't the fact that the people who'd been to the wedding before were clever. They just knew what one of Lisa's weddings was usually like. <laughs> and it's the same with an economic cycle. You know what usually happens. The credit crunch should not have come as any surprise to anybody in that it happened. Banks have been doing this for centuries. The only surprise was the order of magnitude of it all. So, you know, people should have been expecting something to go wrong. Banks have got previous form in this. Experience would have helped you in that direction. I'm pleased to say it helped, uh, helped, helped thread a needle. So it you gives you experience of when things might go wrong. There's also experience of what kind of things might go wrong. Does anybody in the room don't know Mark Twain's definition of a mine? Mark De Twain's definition of a mine, he's very cynical about finance in developing America, Mark Twain's definition of mine was a hole in the ground owned by a liar. <laughs> now, if anybody is going to invest in the mining sector or the oil exploration sector, <coughs> it's used to, you should have that written on your wall because exploration companies exaggerate and make promises that they can't bear out. Anybody who shows up with a nice new finance degree or uh, geologist degree or whatever is likely to be caught out by these people. You just need the experience of cynicism of knowing how it, how it works. Um, I can remember a company called Worldcom in the late uh, 1990s, which was a go-go stock, and they came to visit us. And one of our chaps with great experience said, this isn't a communications company. This is a group of lawyers who happen to own an aerial. This isn't something we should back. And that stock fell dramatically in price when uh, the bubble burst. So, you know, is it all about experience? Um, I've got three caveats to my enthusiasm for experience. Um, the first ca caveat is that experience can be bad. What do I mean by that? I first showed up in the early 1980s, 1981, uh, on the investment scene. And all my older colleagues had actually got their formative experience during the 1970s, when everything that could go wrong did go wrong. So their approach to any positive idea, any view that the world economy could be a good place, they just filtered it out. They only wanted the bad news. And actually, they were very, very, they were more experienced than me. But actually, their experience of the 1970s was a bad experience. They just didn't want to know the good news. And as the world economy got more and more good news throughout the um, uh, uh, 1980s, they were caught out by this. So experience can be bad. Um, another example, um, when I was doing economics, um, we were told that equality of wealth was continually improving. There was some coefficient that I can't remember its name now, and this coefficient was always improving. The world was getting a fairer place. So we were made to write essays about not only had it got a fairer place, but why it would always become a fairer place than that. Um, the only problem is, just as the ink was drying on my essay, because we used pens in those days, not computers, um, Ronald Reagan and Mrs. Thatcher showed up in global capitalism, and this ratio went into sharp reverse, and is still in sharp reverse. So if you were basing your investments in the 1980s on this perceived logic, which had been going on for about 100 years of the world getting fairer, and you were buying the kind of stocks that benefited from that, you were going to be wrong. So experience can be bad because it can be drawn entirely from a time period which is no longer uh, represented. Um, the second uh, caveat on experience is you don't actually have to have been there. You can read about it. There are books. Now, you know, if you read about parachuting or skydiving, it probably doesn't quite capture the adrenaline rush. You probably can't say that you know about skydiving through reading about it. 
I'm afraid that economic history is a little drier. So if you read, you can actually learn this stuff. You don't need to have been there. And if I have one criticism of uh, modern business schools, economics departments, or whatever, there's an awful lot of theory and not enough history. Um, I actually wanted to go to university to, uh, to read history, but my father told me I couldn't have to go and do something more practical, so maybe I have a bias here. But you can learn an awful lot from what's gone on in the past, as well as, 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 as the theory. Um, and I'd like to give you a, a couple of examples um, here. Um, the first is reading about what happened with the railroad boom in the, 19, in the um, uh, 19th century in the United States was a great guide to how to look at the, uh, what happened in uh, the growth of the internet. Um, the first thing to say about it is, if you look at the returns to railroad stocks in the 19th century, it was all front end loaded. As people got the license and started to build the railroads, you got all the returns. By the time the passengers were actually traveling on the trains and the money was being paid, the stocks had discounted this, and they were actually quite unexciting. And of course, you saw exactly this in the internet boom. It was all front end loaded. Um, uh, and if you thought about this, you could spot this claim. And I can remember a, a young colleague, and I'm marching in because we had given instructions at the end of 99 to sell all our technology stocks. We've been very heavy in it. And he said, you just don't understand. You're too old. You don't get the internet. It's not even a computer on your desk. You don't get it. Um, you're an idiot. And you're probably right I was an idiot. But in this case, I was actually uh, right because I just read the history books. And of course, I wasn't against these stocks. Otherwise, we wouldn't have owned them in the first place. It was just clear that just like the railroad, all the returns had come up front. A second example from, uh, from, from that period, um, there's a, 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 I don't know if any of you read any of the books by Professor John Kay, brilliant writer, um, and uh, he writes very insightfully about microeconomics, and he wrote a lovely article about uh, 10 years ago um, called, Is It a Break or Is It a Signal? And it was talking about the development of the railroads, and Westinghouse was a very successful company because it made the brakes for, uh, for trains. And as trains travelled across America, you can't just stop the locomotive, you have to stop the carriages behind. They all have to stop together. So the braking systems have to be able to interconnect. So if you're going across the United States, once one braking system was a standard, everybody had to buy it. So you had a monopoly. You couldn't just start a rival <coughs> braking system because you know, your coaches wouldn't click on. So the people making the, uh, the braking system made a lot of money. Everybody thought the people making the signalling systems would do well. Signals do not have to be interconnected. Provided it says stop in some way, it can work in a variety of manners. You can have a variety of different standards. The stop sign can look different in Wyoming than it does in, 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 uh, in California. So there was no standard. So the barriers to entry were a lot lower. Once you look through that frame of reference, you begin to look at all technology stocks in that. Is it a break or is it a signal? And you could argue, for example, that um, uh, 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 Facebook is a break. It's a standard. Everybody's there. Breaking is very, very hard. It's why that stock will probably perform quite well. If you look at all the internet um, retail companies, low barriers to entry. There are signals. Um, lots of people went into internet travel. We all now do our, um, uh, all our own travel on the internet. But one stock that was floated in the UK at 380 pence uh, finally went out at 18 pence. Um, this was no sustainable return on equity here. So reading about history can give you um, a, an insight here. The final thing to, uh, to say on uh, problems for experience is some things have just not been experienced before. So there's no experience to learn from. If you look at the uh, globalization of the last <coughs> 30 years, in a way, there wasn't a roadmap. We are tremendously enthusiastic about, uh, about China and what's going on there. But during that development, there's been no roadmap. There is no history of a non-democratic communist country embracing capitalism but not changing its political system. There is no roadmap. So there isn't always experience to draw on. But having had those three um, uh, 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 caveats, I still think experience is, is very, very um, uh, valuable. One thing I would say where there is no uh, roadmap, of course, for those who have true vision and can see something that other people cannot see, I think you can make an awful lot of money. But that, I think, is the subject of a very, very different talk that I haven't really got time to cover here um, today. Up till now, I've been talking about how you might select individual securities. Um, and of course, that's not necessarily what we do. We, our job is to pick securities, but then to assemble them together into a portfolio. 
So if we move on to that area, where does education sit versus experience? And I guess just as the, uh, 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 the information bit was uh, an advantage to education, uh, I guess it is in portfolio construction, particularly the number of tools that have come onto the market, uh, the, the advances in theory in how you should put for, for portfolios together. And I think one of the drawbacks of people who are managing money just with a lot of experience, but maybe not, not, not of academic now, is they often don't understand the risks embedded in their portfolio. So uh, I, I think that is something where education has <coughs> happens. The only thing I would say is there is still a, a role for experience in, in analyzing whether these models are appropriate or not. And, and so the caveat I will give here is an example outside the long only securities world, which is in the world of the CDO. Um, uh, earlier, this, uh, earlier in the, uh, in, in the noughties decade, uh, people were approaching Threadneedle on our fixed income side trying to persuade into the wisdom of, of doing CDOs. And uh, they produced all these complex models that showed that the default risk in all the loans was not correlated. Um, now, the problem with these models is they were based on about seven years' data, and they were never not actually building in a significant setback in the economy. And anybody who reads any history will tell you that the point you get a significant uh, setback, the correlation <coughs> of loan defaults goes up dramatically. So there were these incredibly complex models being produced by very bright people with PhDs telling us that you could go and build portfolios of loans and you could lever them up and you weren't building any risk. And this was clearly rubbish. And you saw what happened with these. So I think experience can be helpful in actually analyzing whether the model actually works in those situations on that. <coughs> the, the thing with the CDAs didn't make sense. So, you know, if you look at a scorecard for education versus experience, uh, I think both of them um, have an awful lot of pluses. Uh, they also have some minuses. So, so, so which wins? Um, I guess that uh, I would say, actually, that's not a choice you have to make. Because the beauty of investment is you don't have to do it on your own. You don't have to have one person just managing your money. And the whole part of the, the last bit of my talk is about <coughs> how you should blend education experience, how you should blend different approaches and get people to work together into teams to get the best result. You do not have to go and say, well, I'll have that experienced guy, even though his education isn't great, or I'll have this guy who's very bright but he hasn't much experience. You can hire a group of people and you can get them to work together and get the best of each. So how does that play? Um, if you're running your own company, um, there was a big move in the um, uh, end of the 1990s and beginning of the 2000s to believe in the star culture in terms of a fund manager. A fund had to be run by one person who had to be a dominant personality and you had to back income what may. This is not the way we manage money and I'm pleased to say that it has been found out by the marketplace. Too many of these so-called stars have blown up and I think people are looking now at a much more collegiate way of managing money as the, way, as the way forward. So my advice if you're ever uh, unlucky enough to find yourself managing a, a fund management company is get people to work together, get the best out of the team. You can have some very, very bright young CFAs and you can put them working together with people with 30 years experience. If you have mutual respect, this is the very important thing. Um, people can only work together and get the best out of one another if they respect one another's skills. If they do not, then I think you have a, uh, a, a significant problem. And I think one of the cultural challenges in running a fund management department like that is to get people who are opposites or who are certainly not clones of one another to actually respect the relative uh, skill sets um, uh, of, of one another. <coughs> um, I think the next question is, if you're developing your career, what, what should you do? Um, the answer is, if you're educated, try and get as much experience uh, as, as possible. And you can fast track that, as I say, by reading economic history. There's an awful lot of information out there. Um, what does frustrate me is that, uh, not that management books aren't useful, but people seem to spend an awful lot of time reading books on how to manage people, how people should be managed, how to self-improve, and whatever. And read very little time, uh, spend very little time reading about uh, the successes of business and the failure of businesses and trying to learn from that history and try and marry it with the theory. Well, how does that fit in with the theory? There's an awful lot of stuff written. Um, it's just probably less well read than the, uh, 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 than the books of, uh, of how to actually manage and, and incentivize people. Um, the second thing is, you know, 
be aware of your own weaknesses. If you haven't got experience, position yourselves with people that have. You know? If you're uh, 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 an old fool like me and you, you're not up with all these modern techniques, just hire people who tell you about them and try and marry it with your own experience. If you're aware of your own shortcomings, you can compensate for them. You don't have to do it all on your own. Finally, uh, one of the thing, uh, things that was mentioned in the, in, 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 in the question I set, you know, do consultants get this? What should you do if you're buying fund management services? Um, well, I'll be my answer to what you should do if you're buying fund management services is going to be obvious. You've got to make sure that the company you're hiring does combine education and experience. My advice would be that if you find a company which is long of people uh, uh, with experience, but very, very short of people doing proper financial ex uh, analysis, why do you need to go to that company? On the vice versa, if you've got some very, very bright people with nice shiny degrees, but they haven't been managing money for long, I guess you have to be cynical about it. And let's face it, this industry is not short of competition. It is not short of people who, um, who want to sell you their services. So why should you accept second best? Um, one of the other issues that I mentioned is, uh, do intermediaries actually get this? Do the people who are advising people on which fund managers to hire, do they actually understand that? Now this is an interesting question. Um, I think on the retail and wholesale side, the evidence has been that they, they haven't. Um, and there have been large amounts of money around the world which have shot off to cult star fund managers without really understanding what they're doing, how they're doing it, and more particularly, the risk controls that they have around them. Um, now, born of some of the bad experience during the credit crunch of many of these fund managers, I think the intermediary community is professionalizing and beginning to ask more of the right, uh, right questions. So I think historically, uh, you would give the, uh, an average bad score, not to say that there aren't some people who've been very, very good in this area, we're talking about the average here, but I think that what you're seeing is that that area is now professionalizing very quickly and realizing it has to pay a lot more attention to the product that it is buying and the services it on offer and the range of skills within the organization they're buying. Um, with regard to um, uh, intermediary, the, the, the higher end intermediaries for institutional and pension work, um, I think they do get it in theory. Whether they always get it in practice is another matter. But uh, I think they, uh, they, they do understand this, and they do look in detail at the resources of companies. Whether they always get it right is, is another matter, and we might discuss that during the, uh, during the question time. Education versus experience, um, which matters? Um, I think in the end, I'd have to say that if you look at other professions versus the investment profession, there is a lower correlation between higher academic achievement and future success than you would say find in the law or in medicine. Um, that is not to say that education doesn't matter, but I think it tells you that we are a profession, if indeed we are a profession, where experience probably matters more than it does in other professions. So you're not going to get by on, on education alone. Uh, so I would come down in saying that if you had a sort of uh, scattergram of, 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 of practical experience versus education, we would be more on the experience side as a profession, which is not to say the education doesn't matter, but I observe that. Um, but uh, I think in, in the end, as a conclusion, I'd say that good judgment uh, basically is born of bad experience. Uh, and of course, bad experience is generally born of bad judgment. So uh, uh, basically, experience is good, of course, provided you learn from that. Uh, although there's a presupposition from all my uh, discussion of the advantages of, uh, of experience that you actually learn from your bad experiences. And of course, the most dangerous people in investment are those who are head down, charging through every catastrophe, failing to learn, le failing to learn from their failures. Um, you'll get a lot of failures if you go into the investment management world. They're all valuable if you learn from them and put them in the memory bank and it reduces the chance of doing it again. I hope that was, uh, was, was useful. I've specifically left a, a, a good 20 minutes at the end for questions. I've been assured that there will be a lot of questions, but I thought in a way it would be better to explore the topic through such questions rather than we carry on rambling on. But thank you very much for your attention.